Hey there, friends. Welcome to the Taking Your Next Step podcast from Collegians for Christ. Through each episode, we will journey together focusing on knowing what you believe and why you believe it. If you are eager, like I am, to strengthen your faith and take your next step now by joining us in today's episode. So in our episode last week, we looked at the fact that you and I have an enemy who walks about seeking whom he may destroy. We've talked about how real this enemy is and his desire is to destroy us. But how can we defend ourselves? I think we all feel the effects of Satan. You've seen it in in school. You've seen it in class. You see it in our culture. You've seen it in your family. You've experienced it personally, how Satan can deceive, how Satan can cast doubt, how Satan can cause fear, how he comes to us as an angel of light. So it's hard to tell when it's him and when it's not. So you and I have to be very discerning. But Peter tells us, hey, you can have victory. You can defeat this devil, this roaring lion. But we must understand we cannot do it ourselves. We do not have the power nor the wisdom to do it ourselves. Satan is too powerful and he's too wise. But we have to remember he's not all powerful and all wise like God is. But he tells us here to be sober and be vigilant. What does that mean? Sober means we're watchful. It means mentally self-controlled. That's something that we all need to work at. I don't know about you, but my mind is always working. It's always racing. Sometimes I wish it would just stop, right? Always thinking of something. And you say, well, I go to sleep. But our minds still don't stop because we're dreaming things and we're waking up thinking of stuff. I mean, I find myself waking up in the, <clears throat> in the middle of the night thinking about stuff. Why? Because my mind is going. But if we're going to be sober, we're going to have to be mentally self-controlled. Why is this so important? Because the vast majority of the battles with Satan will be won or lost in the mind. That's where it's going to go down. So much of this is going to happen in our minds. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, we see a passage here. It says, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Watch this. In whom the God of this world, speaking of Satan, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Notice the minds. It's always interesting. It's not their eyes. He blinds their minds some type of mental block, some type of deception, some type of doubt is placed there. For what reason? Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So those that are lost, he places a mental block to keep them from believing. You best believe believers, he casts the same type of mental block to hinder our belief in God, to hinder our faith, to help us, to, I'm sorry, to hinder us from believing more. And then Paul would go on in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, casting down imaginations. Let me back up one. <clears throat> he says this, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. That's what he's talking about in Ephesians. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through the God to the pulling down of strongholds. And he says this, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So you and I must have, must be mentally self-controlled. We cannot allow our minds to wander. We cannot allow Satan to have a place in our mind. And that's why he says you need to be sober and vigilant. You need to be awake, alert. You cannot sleep. You cannot get comfortable. You cannot take your guard down. You must be constantly on watch. Because Satan uses deception and deceit, which can be so hard to recognize. And when you cannot recognize it, Guess what? It can have a a powerful effect on you. But where is it going to go down? It's going to go down in your mind. So you and I need to be sober and vigilant. We need to have a constant awareness of what we're thinking about, where we're placing our mind, the content we're allowing to come into our mind. That's why it's so important. And it's so easy to let your mind, I mean, to let your guard down or let your mind wander. How many times have you gone down the rabbit hole of even you're telling yourself you're not enough, you're not good enough, and you let your mind keep wandering. Well, guess what? The more you think that, that's exactly what you're going to think of yourself. We're going to talk about this in some future episodes. 
about how powerful the mind is and how we allow our thoughts to go somewhere will in turn truly make us think that about ourselves. And so we must have control of our mind. We must be sober. We must be vigilant because Satan wants to cause doubt to draw you away from God, for you to question God, for you not to trust God, for you to walk away from God, for you to find yourself out there in the world mad at God, angry at God, frustrated at God, or just forgetting God. That's his goal. And it's going to happen where? In the mind. So you and I, you and I have to be self-controlled mentally. Take control of your thoughts. If you struggle with pornography, take control of your thoughts. If you struggle in other areas of mental issues, anxiety, depression, you have to learn to stop and take control of your thoughts. Find God's promises. Find God's word. I understand depression's real. Anxiety's real. Uh, we don't dismiss that. We don't say, here's the one cure-all, but here's some things that we can do to remove the fear. Here's some things we can do to remove the doubt, to find answers to your questions. If you have questions and you have doubts, share it with someone. Find the answers. Quit tucking it under the rug because what's going to happen? You're going to tuck this one. You're going to tuck this one. You're going to tuck this one. And then some major issue is going to happen in your life. And because you don't have those doubts settled, you're going to run from God, get angry at God, or just, just throw your hands up at it all because you've not taken the time to truly know what you believe and why you believe it. And so Satan works hard. He works overtime. So we must be sober. We must be vigilant. But he said this, be strong in the faith. We can resist him steadfast in the faith. Resist means to withstand. We don't move. We hold the line. You don't retreat. Steadfast is a military term that means unmovable. It means you're not going to be moved. We can stand unmovable by what? By our faith. And that's why it's so important that you get these doubts resolved. That's why it's so important that you know what you believe and why you believe it. But this is why Satan tries every tactic he can to cause us to doubt. You see, doubt leads to defeat, but faith leads to victory. One writer said it this way when we're talking about what does it mean to resist him steadfast in the faith? The best way for believers to take a firm stand is to be strong in their faith. This means trusting in Christ who has already defeated Satan and will ultimately destroy him. So yes, Satan is powerful, but you and I follow one who is more powerful. Satan is powerful and bent on destroying us, but you and I follow one who has already destroyed him. Another writer said this, this means that we take our stand on the word of God. And refuse to be moved. Unless we stand, we cannot withstand. Our weapons are the word of God and prayer, and our protection is the complete armor God has provided. We resist him in the faith. That is our faith in God. Just as David took his stand against Goliath and trusted in the name of Jehovah, so we take our stand against Satan in the victorious name of Jesus Christ. Now think with me for just a moment. Jesus was 40 days in the wilderness tempted of Satan. Each time Satan brought a temptation to him, what did Jesus use as his defense mechanism or as his uh, defense tool? He used scripture three separate times. He quoted scripture back to Satan as his defense. There's a lot of value and a lot of truth there. As Satan comes to us, you and I need to have God's word hidden in our heart. We need to have a few verses that we go to. I have a few verses that I go to when Satan begins to cause fear, when he begins to cause me to doubt. There's certain verses when he begins to cause me to feel like I'm not enough, that I'm not good enough. I have to go over to Ephesians chapter 1 and say, no, I am. Because guess what? In my mind, Satan begins to tear me down. It made me feel less than, made me feel like I'm not good enough and all these mistakes and all these different things. And it becomes this, I mean, your mind will go on for hours and you'll be so down and heavy on yourself. <clears throat> but as you take God's word, Ephesians chapter one, to know that those that are in Christ are chosen, they're called, they're sealed. I'm chosen. I'm called. 
I'm sealed. I know I have value and I know I have worth. I know I am good enough for God because of what he did for me. I, I'm loved. And there's so many things in that chapter. So I have to go there and remind myself of that. So scripture is powerful. But we also have to put on the whole armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6 talks about that. He tells us we're to put on the whole armor of God that we can stand against the wiles of the devil, all his tactics. The beautiful thing is God has equipped us. Yes, he walks about as a roaring lion, but God has given us the equipment, the armor, the protection. But you and I must take it all. We must put on, yes, the, the belt of truth. We must gird our loins with the belt of truth. We must put on the breastplate of righteousness. We must have the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We must have on the the helmet of salvation. We put on the whole armor. We can't just take a piece of it. We have to take it all. But notice when you put that armor, if you could visualize that armor on a person, on yourself or on a soldier, their entire front is covered. But as soon as they turn around, there's nothing covering the back. And so God created the Christian life to be constantly marching forward, to put your hand to the plow and to go forward. He says, if you put your hand to the plow and you begin to look back, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. Not only that, you're also, as you turn around, you begin to retreat or you begin to walk backwards or you begin to walk back out into the world. You are exposing yourself to the wiles of the devil for those flaming arrows that Ephesians talks about that he shoots that will stick and they'll do what? They begin to burn fester. So you and I must approach Satan head on and we must move forward. But we also have a hope in all of this, which is what Peter's talked about throughout this whole book, is that you and I have a living hope. And here's what it says, but the God of all grace who hath called us, think about that, he's called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. You are called. And God's call to you is eternal. There's nothing Satan can do to break or or destroy this calling. It is eternal. There's nothing Satan can do. He can maybe harm you physically with sickness. He could harm you uh, with evil physically, but he cannot do anything to hurt, harm, harm or destroy your soul. If you've given your life to Christ, you've believed on him, that is settled. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit, and there's nothing he can do to change that. You have a living hope. Your calling is eternal and will only suffer here for a short time on earth, but the glory that we will experience with God in heaven is for eternity. So we'll suffer here for a few years, but what we get with God, there's no comparison. And you and I are promised this, watch this, that after you have suffered a while, Peter, you suffered in this book 15 times. So suffering is real. You're going to suffer. I hate that. I wish I could tell you otherwise. I wish I could tell you, hey, because you're a believer, you're never going to go through anything again. Somebody tells you that they're preaching to you the the false gospel because you're going to suffer. Everybody's going to suffer. And your suffering is not just uh, specific to you. Everybody goes through things. But watch this. But after you suffer a while, he will make you perfect. He will establish you. He will strengthen you. He will settle you. It means he's going to perfect us. God is going to restore you. He will set right what has gone wrong. He will remove that sinful nature. He will set in order and judge the evil actions of those that have tried to harm you or cause suffering in your life. He will establish you. You see, God has provided us with the Holy Spirit and the tools so that we can stand against the opposition. He's established us on a rock. He will strengthen us. He will make us mentally and physically strong. Do you need the discernment to know what voices to listen to? Do you need the discernment to know when to say yes and when to say no, what decision to make here and what decision to make over here? God's word and God through his spirit will give you that. He will make you mentally and physically strong. God's strength is given to us through the Holy Spirit to face the demands of life. And he will settle us. On a solid foundation, you see, we're built upon a rock. Jesus Christ and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. I love the mountains. We lived there for seven years. I love, and you see those mountains, and you see those massive rocks up there. We're talking about we're built upon a rock similar to that giant mountain that cannot be moved. 
Jesus Christ is the rock bigger than any mountain, but something we can try to comprehend is our feet are set on that mountain. There's nothing that can move it. The gates of hell cannot prevail against us. There is nothing that can take you from God. You are eternally secure. And so you and I can endure the suffering we experience because we have a living hope. You and I have to be vigilant. We have to be sober because the reality is you have an enemy and he's trying every way he can. And he's not coming to you and saying, hey, and saying your name, I'm Satan. I'm here to hurt you. He's walking around seeking whom he may destroy. And guess who that's going to be? It's going to be that person who has already hurt a little bit who is already down a little bit, who is allowing themselves to be isolated, whether it's isolation physically or if it's just isolation mentally, that's where he wants you. And can I say this? Secrecy is the enemy of victory. If you do not learn to share and express your doubts and express what's going on in your life to someone you can trust, then that secrecy is going to bring you down. It's going to keep you from getting victory. That's why you have to receive help. You have to talk. You have to share. You have to be willing uh, to get answers, to resolve your doubts and so forth, whatever's going on. So secrecy is the enemy of victory. But know this, though Satan's out to destroy you, right? You and I can resist him in the faith. You and I have an eternal hope a living hope in God. So no matter what happens on this earth, you have a hope in Jesus Christ. Thank you for taking the time to listen. If this podcast has been helpful to you, please share it with a friend or subscribe to stay up to date on the latest episodes. You can connect with Collegians for Christ online for more information and resources at cfccampusministry.com.